I'm, uh, I work for Property Valuation and Review. I am the field director. I've been at Property Valuation and Review for 27, 26, 27 years. I can't even keep track anymore. This is Terry Gildersleeve. She also works for Property Valuation. And what's your title? Property Operations Valuation Chief. Operations Chief. And we've, we've been there almost the same amount of time. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's a small room. I think we'll be all right. How many of you are brand new listers? I know I recognize some faces. So three years. Like brand new. Uh, less than three years. Yes. yes. For me, less than three years is pretty brand new. Because yeah. yeah. you know, you probably heard it before. We always say it takes at least three years to like start to, you know, and by that third year, you start to say. It's kicking in, it's really kicking in, and then things start to, and oftentimes we'll have people take classes repeatedly just for that reason. Like you just can't possibly absorb everything right away, and, and you don't expect to, because that's okay. It's just too much. Nobody has, you know, most people don't have any idea all of the things that blisters do. It's huge. It's absolutely huge, the amount of things we have to touch. So what we're going to do is go through just some basic terminology and resources for new listers. If any of you that have been here a long time want to chime in, right, and add anything, that's great. I mean, we're a small group, so we can kind of, kind of just roll with it. If you have any weird questions that you've been afraid to ask, again, we only have a very small group, so ask away. Um, you know, if I can't, if I don't know the answer, I will get you the answer. So. We'll go with that, okay? All right, so basically, what is a lister? <coughs> a lister is elected, which I think is a good thing. For me, it's a good thing. An assessor who is hired by the town is not elected. So that means that they are, um, because they are hired by the town, sometimes they might be under the nail of the select board a little bit more than listers. Listers can say, I'm elected by the public, I have an obligation to the public. So for me, that's a wonderful thing about listers and I think that's why we don't want to lose listers. It's really one of the great things about Vermont for me. Um, they're charged with maintaining the grand list of the town. There are tasks, as we know, that are monthly, weekly, daily, it becomes more and more like we talked about. Things like using the property transfer tax return. Anytime a property transfers, you have to get familiar with that and how that relates to deed changes and ownership in the grand list. Adding value to the property on the grand list for building permits and learning what that means. We're currently teaching a data collection class, which if you haven't done it, you know, sometimes that first year it's a little bit much, but maybe second year or third year. You can take that data collection class and really learn all those elements of construction <coughs> to quality and it's a four day class we're teaching it right now. I think it's a great add on once you get there. Um, so adding on those permits and reviewing lists for different things like exemptions and things like that. And the idea behind the grant list is I should be able to come into your town, look at your map, assuming you have one, right? and point to any dot on that map and you would have a reference to it in your grand list. Right? Whether it be taxable, non-taxable, or exempt. If I pointed my finger, you could, you would be able to pull it up. That's the idea. We want a complete <laughs> encompassing inventory of everything in your town so that we can say to the taxpayers, we put every single thing on that grand list and we account for it whether it's taxable or not. Does that make sense? So the first thing that you do is each time you're elected, not the first time, but every time you're elected, you have to take the oath. And, and you're not officially a lister when your term expires even. You're not officially a, a lister until you take this with the town clerk. It's like... And then every time elected thereafter, right? Yeah. Correct? Okay. Um, office hours, so what should happen is you should have an organizational meeting each year in March after elections and you should say what are we going to have for office hours that we're going to post that the public can come in if they want to, okay? And you're expected to have certain hours, it doesn't mean that you have to have 
nine to five every day or even one to six every day. Depends on the size of your town, right? You may have very limited hours, and let's just say, for example, you can't have any hours for some reason. You all work full-time jobs. As long as you have a way that the public can contact you and get those records within a reasonable amount of time, you're still okay. All right? Who's the meeting with? Your other listeners? Yes. Okay. Yep. So and <clears throat> because it's an organizational meeting, right, we have open meeting laws, which means it should you should warn that meeting and you should take notes of that meeting and it should be an official. And if somebody wanted to come in and sit and listen, they could. Does, does it really happen? No, not that I've ever seen. But if they wanted to, they could. Okay? And you're going to give that organizational meeting. You can ask the town clerk, how do we do it? How do we post? Because they do it all the time. Right. So they're, they're, they're your number one contact. Okay, what do we do? So, things to get you started. How to proceed. How to, sorry, how to process a PTTR, or a property transfer tax return, and how to find a deed. So one of the first things I think that listeners should learn, if you haven't done it yet, find out how to look up a deed. Go to the clerk and say, listen, how do you catalog the deeds? How would I find one if I wanted to? I have a property transfer right here. I see that on the back side you've recorded it in book 56, page 356. Can you show me where I find that and how I look at it? It's so important. And it doesn't happen a lot, right? So the way that the attorneys always explain it to me is that property transfer return, which is what you typically get from the clerk, is really just a receipt. It means I bought something in Vermont. It's a receipt for a transaction. So we all know receipts can be good and bad, right? That receipt might not tell us everything we need. So we gotta go a little bit further and look at that deed, okay? Hi, come on in. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> so one other thing you wanna ask the town clerk is, I don't have the deed reference, I have a name. How do I find the deed using just a name? because I'm sure they have some kind of index to look it up. And sometimes things like they didn't buy the whole property, they only gave part interest away, things like that aren't very easy to pick up just by looking at that property transfer. If you know all the boxes to look at, you might catch it, but it's good to take a scan of that deed. Yeah, you're, sh you're shaking your head, yes. Okay. <laughs> Who knows? So now, how, oh, do you have a question? Now, we've had a couple of situations where the parents or the grandparents have passed away and they, by their will, gave a third interest to one child, a third interest to another, and a third interest to another. And there has not been coordination between the siblings. So each one wants their separate tax bill because they live in different towns and different locations. So how does one address that issue when you're making the grand list and trying to get the values. You take a third of the total values and put it on parcel dot dot one dot two dot three or how, how do you go about it? Nope. So it would be if the three of us, right, this is Cam, he works for our office. Terry, Cam and I own a third, it would be one parcel in the grand list. We each have a third percentage, right? And for me, I would take the first owner that came through and that would be my mailing until they tell me different. And they gotta pick somebody that the mailing's going to. So the family has to resolve. They gotta, yep, and if they tell you no, we're gonna, I'm gonna put it in writing that we want it to go to Cam, not Terry or Christy, then fine. Then I'll do that, but they gotta pick one. Two, two of them paid the taxes, one of them didn't. Okay, uh, so it gets even more, yeah. I mean, it's uh, and a lot I don't of wanna get in the middle of it. Yeah, so you know a lot of situations like that with new owners too, right? So our obligation is April 1. We're listing as of April 1, tax bills go out as of April 1. And a lot of times people will say to you, well, change it to the new owner, change it to the new owner. Nope, April 1, your responsibility if you're a new owner is to find out what your taxes are and et cetera, okay? If your treasurer decides to do otherwise and make copies for folks, that's their 
they're a thing. Really but for Grand List, we're sticking with owner April 1. And we're sticking with one parcel and one owner. Sorry, you got to pick. I'm really sorry. I can't break it up. Yep. Talk to the town clerk. Maybe she'll send a tax bill to the other two. Yep. So how do we keep a running log of permits and inspect properties in the field? <laughs> I'm reading you. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can keep track of this, assuming that you have permitting, right? You may have some sort of spreadsheet you decide to go by. You may run reports from your camera system, which is where you get value, right? You just have to come up with a system that's going to work with, for you that you can go back to each year and say, which properties do we need to go out and inspect and how are we going to manage this? Okay? Everybody does it a little bit different and that's okay. As long as you have some system to keep track of that. All right? So how to value property in your camera system? Start simple with decks and small outbuilding additions. That way you'll build yourself into the houses. And, and, you know, one of the things that for brand new listeners I think is a great exercise is to take your property record card and the other listener's property record card and go out to your property and go and look where you can stand for an hour and look at all the pieces without feeling rushed, without feeling pressured, and really look through how that's done. I think it's a great way to do it when you start, right? It makes you feel a little more comfortable. We've had some people in town that say, I don't want listers on my property at all. Yep, that's okay. So how, how can we get on to see if they've complied with their building permit, take the measurements that they claimed was the deck or the porch or whatever, the outbuilding and stuff. How, how do we accomplish that without, because um, they said no trespassing, you can't come on my property. If they don't want you there, you're gonna have to do the best you can from the information you have, which is probably whatever they filled out on the permit. So, and then we increase the value, and once they appeal it, then we have a right to go on the property? Unfortunately, no. Oh, okay. But if they go to BCA, they have to let the BCA on the property, okay. or their appeal is considered withdrawn. Not denied, so they can't even go forward. Withdrawn. withdrawn. Okay. And you want to be real careful and make sure they write it that way. They don't want to write it as denied because that gives them the right to go on. They want to literally write them a letter that says you did not allow access to the BCA, so therefore your appeal is considered withdrawn, and it's done. Okay? They still don't have to let listers on at that point. You can ask, could we accompany the BCA, but they can say no still. Okay? And back in the day when I was a lister, and I inspected in the non-taxable properties, so I didn't hurt anything, but that's how I learned Oh, make sure I got all the data in the field, make sure. So do do your own property. You, know. you got really good at uh, assessing churches. Oh yeah. my goodness, I went back four times to the same one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I learned fast. And you know, the other thing too is just go with the veteran listers. Hopefully you have them if you're brand new and you don't have any veteran listers then that's when you call your district advisor and say, we need some help, we don't have any veteran listers to help us. But if you do, go alongside them and learn what they do so that you can follow with what they've done. <clears throat> so how to value house site and homestead? Yeah, I think we're gonna get into that a little bit more, but house site and homestead is part of the rule for education <coughs> tax that we've developed. So we need to devise two things in most cases where we have a house. A homestead value, which means if I declare a homestead, that value is gonna be used for what tax rate is attached. Education tax rate, that's the use of that value. And then house site, which is almost exactly the same except only two acres, okay, and only one house, that's used for income sensitivity. So the taxes people pay on that house site value is bounced off of their income. And if they're paying too much, then they'll get what's called a state payment to reduce their taxes. So they have two different purposes, two different numbers and two different purposes. And we have to learn how to navigate that so we can assign those values, which are grievable, 
right? And then the what's called homestead declarations come in every year to say these people declared and they'll be charged that homestead rate and possibly get a payment, possibly. Yeah, I'm sorry for asking all the questions. No, that's good. I've had, I've had people who are uh, homesteaders ask, where does the credit money come from? What is the source of that credit that they show on their tax bill, like $500, $800, $4,000? Does that come from the general tax revenues of the state? Yeah, the education fund all as, as a whole. Yep. Okay. Yep. So it's, it's a general refund from yep. non-homestead real estate payers. Yeah, so it's all, like, if I think of it as all of our money goes there and then part of it goes back, <laughs> right? Okay. So that we can, yeah. We're all, we're all pushing into the same pool to fund education, basically. So, how to process homestead reports and checks? We're going to go through that. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. this is kind of a move. Yeah. How to validate sales, work on sending sales verification forms, and watching what is for sale. So, there's a lot of reasons why you want to know what's for sale in your town, right? Because our charge as listers is to assess at fair market value. Does that happen every day, every year? No, unfortunately, because we're not reappraising every property every year. So in the year of reappraisal, we're at fair market value on April 1st, right? For every property, for about a day. Because <laughs> it's an estimate of value and an estimate of value is good for about a day. Any appraiser will tell you that, right? So then our charge, unfortunately, is year after year to try to be consistent in the way we're assessing folks and treat them by that same measure we did at reappraisal. So we're going to use those same cost schedules to pick up the deck from year to year to treat everyone the same until we can reappraise everyone again. Okay? So what that means, unfortunately, is we do fall away from fair market value. And we all know we're seeing it now because the market's changing a lot. We fall away. But we have to be consistent and stay with what we're doing until we can reappraise. Okay, so it's super important that we pay attention to the sales for that purpose. And then we do, we at Property Valuation, do what's called the equalization study to say what level of assessment you're at. Common level of appraisal, you've heard of that, right? So that's used to convert your numbers in your town to 100% for education purposes. You have to pay 100% whether you're at that or not, okay? If you're at 80%, we're going to add 20% to your values. Just say you got to pay, you town are liable for that because that's your 100% number, okay? In addition, now that the legislature's changed it a little bit, our study decides when you have to do a reappraisal. And there's only one measure now. There used to be two. It used to be the common level of appraisal and what's called the COD. And the COD, it sounds very complicated, but it's not as complicated as it sounds. It's the coefficient of dispersion. And what that means is some properties are assessed at 120% of fair market value. Some are assessed at 60% of fair market value. And that spread between the high and low is too much. We're over assessing some properties, we're under assessing other properties. When that becomes too much, it's not fair for folks. And our fairness measure doesn't meet the standard. So that's the only trigger now that requires reappraisal, according to the new legislative changes. If you're above 20, you're gonna get an order, starting this year. And you can always voluntarily you can always do a reappraisal on your own. And you know when you need a reappraisal. But sometimes the select board, right, that controls the money, wants that hammer. They want the hammer from PBR and they want to wait until that, politically or whatever. Okay. Sorry, I've got another question. Yep. So you're telling me the CLA goes away as of 2024? It goes away for the reappraisal order as of 2023. Okay. okay. The, the orders we send out in June are only based on COD. Okay. Okay. And the CLA still affects tax rates. Yes. And we still equalize your ground. Yes. So if we have a CLA of seventy. Yep. And we go through reappraisal. Yep. And 
it's assumed everything's at fair market value, so that's 100. Yep. The following year, the CLA is going to be the average of 70 and 100? Nope, the following year, we're gonna do a new study with all those sales in the three years that are good sales, right? That's right. part of this validating An sales. The equalization study. The equalization study and all your new values. We'll put all your new values mm -hmm. in when you do a reappraisal and we'll say, how'd you do? So in theory, you should come up right right around 100% because you reappraised everything. We'll do a in whole theory, new study with right. all new values. Because we're not using that 70% value anymore. Yep. That's okay. the old value. Now we're using the ones you just put in place. So a grand list is an inventory of property within a town's boundaries and includes items such as ownership, value, acres, category, exemption, taxable values, um, the status of it. This inventory is printed annually for filing with your town clerk and becomes permanent record within their vault. It is the basis for both municipal and education property taxation. Okay. So what is a PTTR, Property Transfer Tax Return? It's used to calculate and submit taxes due to the state of Vermont for transacting property. While the deed is an instrument and that actually transacts the property, the PTTR contains valuable information you'll need for your grand list maintenance. The information provided to you on both the deed and the PTTR will be entered into your CAMA program. And one of the things that I've seen that, that some towns have used, which I think is great, the PTTR has a lot of places that you have to change ownership. You know, you, have, you might have to look at your maps, you might have to create a new property record card, you might have to change address, there might be multiple places you have names that it needs to go. So making some sort of little checklist that goes with that PTTR to make sure that it's gone all the places that it needs to and made the full loop makes a lot of sense to me, right? Maybe it's a spreadsheet, maybe it's a checklist, maybe it's a rubber stamp, I don't know. Isn't there one out there somewhere, a, a checklist for the PTTRs? I think we, I think we did make yes. one actually. <laughs> and I think that we made it because we had a, had a group of three brand new listers, right? Yeah. So you gotta have somewhere to go. So yeah, we can certainly, we probably should have it here. I think it's in the new lister training documentation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I forget what we have, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so this, the PTTR comes to the town clerk's office with a deed each time a name changes or property is purchased or sold in your town. The deed is a legal written document that transfers ownership and it's, re it, it's recorded in the land records with the town clerk's vault or in the town clerk's vault. Listers use the PTTR and deed to record changes of ownership in the grand list each year to make sure all property is, property is co listed correctly to the owner of record as of April 1 of each year for the grand list and tax bills. And I think the other thing you want to be careful of too that I've seen happen is, uh, remember that property transfer is just a receipt. And don't go changing things like acreage based on that because it's not always right. The deed and or a survey and or your map are going to give, give you a better indication of what the acreage should be. So you have to be really careful and really analyze those pieces. A deed is a document that transfers part or total ownership of the property. Most common deeds you'll encounter are warranty deeds, quick claim deeds, easement deeds, life estate deeds. Um, deeds is submitted to the town clerk for recording in the town ball. Each deed that is recorded must be accompanied by a PTTR in order to be complete. Yeah, and, and in every town it's a little different how the clerk transmits that information to you. Do they give you a copy of the PTTR? Do they electronically scan it? You gotta figure out what works in your town. But for me, best case scenario, if you could, 
get them to give you a copy of that warranty deed right with it, beautiful. Beautiful, right? We have the land records on our computer so we can get into the land records. Beautiful. And we make a copy. Yep, you've got it right there. It to the you've got it right there. That's great. And I think we're getting, you know, we're getting more electronic, so hopefully that'll happen more and more. Um, as much as we're pushing and pulling to get there, I think that's a great, it's a great way to be able to access it. Yeah. And well, you can't make copies of that deed and give it to anyone. The town clerk needs to because she follows a certain procedure. Right, and they also, most of the time, their fees are based on that, so you wouldn't want to. These are kept in the town clerk's vault. These records are typically only are typically only accessible while they are present. You should ask them to show you how their books and indexes work, as well as any digital record system that you may have to access. Most clerks provide a copy of the PTTRs to the listers. It may also be helpful if the clerk is willing to, to ask that they provide, provide you with a copy of the deed as well. This will allow you to work when it's convenient and not require that you are in the office at the same time that the clerk is. Yeah, sometimes that becomes a problem if you're working full-time jobs and you're only going in at night and the clerk isn't there and then you can't get to the vault and they have it all locked up, then it's a, it's a little bit harder. So figuring out a system like that is better. Does so everybody understand PTTR and deeds? Good. So what is a CAMA? CAMA is an acronym used for Computer Assisted Mass Appraisal Program. CAMA programs utilized in Vermont are Microsoft, Patriot, ProVal, and Vision. There might be one or two. There may be others, but one or two towns. These programs are the database in which you will enter data to generate an estimate of fair market value, or FMV, you'll see a lot. You will work with your veteran listers to learn how to navigate this program and do the necessary work. So, CAMA is where you get your value. So you just put that in your head, right? NIMRIC is where I create my grand list. CAMA is where I get my value. My CAMA system might be Microsoft or it might be Patriot or something else, but that's where I get my value. I'm always gonna go there to create value. What is fair market value or FMV? Fair market value is an estimate of value of a property that a property will bring on the open market. For purposes of the annual property tax administration, Fair market value must be estimated based on the market at the, time, at the time of the last town's reappraisal in order to maintain equity. For this reason, you must be willing to accept that fair market value we find may not be the same as what this property might sell for, say five years after the reappraisal. Yeah, so we're using, let's say, like, when's your last reappraisal? 2008. 2008. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, 2008, that right? <laughs> that means best case scenario, this town is using schedules and market data from 2008. You've got a sale in 2023. You're using that system. There is no possible way you are going to hit current numbers, and you shouldn't. Right? A new house, you shouldn't. Because it wouldn't be fair to me if I came into your house, in your town, and I built a new house, if you judged me by a different standard than you did everyone else in 2008. So you've got to stay with that exact same standard, knowing you're not going to hit the numbers until you reappraise. And as long as you know that, right, it's okay. It might be a hard pill to swallow, right? But as long as you know that, you know you're treating people fair and you can be equitable, and that's the point. Yeah. Even in that, when there's a house that already exists and they sell it, and you look at what the appraised for back in 2008, yeah. $875,000, they're now selling it for $2.2 million. Yeah. yeah. 
Exactly. This is Grand Isle on the lake too. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, very exactly. Beautiful. You can't even you can't even touch it. Yeah. It is. So if, if someone's building a new house now. Yep. We go into the square footage numbers for in the CAMA program for 2015, which, which was when we had our last reappraisal. Yep. And even though they're spending $275,000 to build the house, we use the values from 2015 and say its fair market value is going to be 135. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's better to be fair than right in this case. And even though it's supposed to be fair market value, you know you're at whatever percent, 80, 80 something percent, yep. right? So you know, on average, you're already that low, right? And there's nothing you can do about it until you do a reappraisal. Okay. So it wouldn't surprise me that you couldn't possibly get any higher than 80%, maybe even less than that, using your schedules, because it was built way back in 15, right? Everything's changed, cost of construction's changed, Markets change, what people will pay has changed dramatically, right? So there's nothing we can do except to know I got to treat everybody fairly, which means I'm not going to come out at fair market value. Because if you don't do it fairly, your COD, it's going to happen. That spread's going to get bigger. Yeah. But in, in, we, we've had several situations where assessed property was 250, 275, and they sold for 775. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we've exactly. had similar situations in the town so our cla got because of the equalization study really out of whack yeah but it's the people from the flatlanders from new jersey and new york and long island and boston that come here and say oh well this is a great deal i'll pay you know 575 for this place when it's actually only worth 200. yeah yeah but that so that raises all of our taxes up right. unnecessarily so when we talk about fair market value, right, my answer to that comment always is, if you were to put your property on the market, would you say I'm not willing to sell it to anybody from New Jersey or Massachusetts, or or would you say I want the highest dollar I can get? Well, it depends, you know. Okay, well most people, most people, the typical seller, wants the most money they can get. Yeah. So they're not gonna limit, if my market is Massachusetts, New Jersey, and they're willing to pay more, bring it, bring it. That's what we have to deal with. That's fair market value, right? Mm -hmm. They're part of our market. They're driving our market, whether we like it or not. So- And, and that's gonna make so, our COD get out of whack all Right. Mm -hmm. So and we only have a couple more minutes. Yeah. I can't believe it's so quick. Well, we started a little late, because it's, oh, that's yeah, right. we were early. So um, appraisal versus assessment. Most people are familiar with appraisal. If you go to buy or refinance a house, you need an appraisal, which is an estimate of fair market value of the property as of a specific date for certain purpose. An assessment is also an estimate of fair market value for each property in town, set as of April 1 of the year of the last reappraisal. Assuming both were done on April 1 of the same year, the number should be similar. But in order to be fair to all taxpayers, we must use the same reappraisal standards for all properties until the next reappraisal. Yeah. And we were just talking about So that. when the situation was in reverse, people would bring you their fee appraisal from financing, and they would say it came out much lower, and I want you to change it. They're probably not coming into your office now, right? Because when they're getting an appraisal, it's much higher than So you, the good news is you probably don't have much grievance. <laughs> So CAMA versus Grand List. CAMA is where values are created. It also stores general information regarding ownership. The Grand List is where information is recorded for tax billing purposes, such as names, addresses, total value, exemptions, etc. For 2023, the Grand List will be in the Nimric program, as we know. The 2024 Grand List will be in the new program, VTPI, or Vermont Property Information Exchange. We currently have a couple of pieces, current use and homestead live in the VTPI program as well as the sales verification. So we're slowly transitioning pieces over and hopefully that will make its way fully by next year. That's the hope. So what is a lister card? This document is 
is the listing of the property value for a real estate property in your town with the corresponding information about the land, buildings, improvements, and values of each of to give the property a total taxable value. Have your veteran listers walk you through how your lister cards look and where the pieces of information can be found, aka the property record card. I think that's what uh, listers spend a lot of time doing is just explaining to folks how things are, how values are derived. So if you can start to understand that property record card or cost sheet, that goes a long ways to being able to talk to folks. And some of this terminology and talking about where you're at relative to fair market value and things like that come about. So what is a property tax bet? Your town likely, hopefully, has property maps that depict each parcel of land in the town and the ownership as well as the size and dimensions of the parcel. Depending on the level of mapping you have, these might also be in digital format, which you, where you can look at each parcel with overlays for things like flood zone, zoning, wetland, things like that. Have your veteran lister show you the maps, how they're used, and how they're updated in your town. It's a beautiful thing the more you can get integrated with your grand list and your mapping and if you're not there yet that's something to work towards right if i if i have maps maybe next year i can get it integrated with my grand list and i click on a parcel and it tells me exactly that grand list information right there it's a beautiful thing so you know there's money there that you have from from the reappraisal fund if you haven't used it especially if you've waited since 2000 Eight. <laughs> you probably got a good fund sitting there, and as long as you have enough to fund your reappraisal, still you could use some of that towards your mapping, right? So, what is current use? Current use, or CU, you see a lot, or LUC, things like that, aka land use, is a program that landowners may enroll their land in if it's used for agricultural, forest conservation land purposes. The landowner applies with the current use program and signs the application agreeing to have a lien placed on their property in return for an exemption or reduction in their taxable value. Basically, there are, they are agreeing to continuing to use their land for that purpose in return for an exemption in value. Listers work each year to value the portions of their property that are subject to the current use exemption, and those are not for the grant, not for the grand list purposes. And this is a whole nother one to two day class, and Elizabeth Hunt, who is the director of the current use program, is in the back, so she could always uh, have discussions with you, but she helps and we do a couple day class every year just on that, so it's a great resource for you. So what is a 411? A 411 is a report that can be viewed and printed from the grand list software that shows all the values in the town grand list in a summary version. The report is used by the listers to check and reconcile totals and used by the treasurer and select board to set, set tax rates for the town. Listers will sign the 411 each year to attach it to the grand list stating that the grand list is complete and accurate as far as they know. I like to think of the 411 as sort of your accounting piece that you're balancing things with. If you think of it like balancing your checkbook, that's kind of your register that you're gonna keep going back to when you add, when you subtract, when you reconcile at the end of the year to make sure that things are, all those numbers are in place and that it makes sense. So you should be looking at that frequently and, and balancing that frequently. What is grievance? A taxpayer can grieve or make an official argument against the value of their property in any given year. There is a grievance time and place which is posted to the public and notices are sent to all property owners whose value changed that year allowing them to grieve. The taxpayer comes and meets with the listers or submits a letter of grievance and the lister hears this grievance in an open hearing or public meeting. 
As a result, listers may make a decision to change or leave the value the same, and then they notify the taxpayer of the result. The taxpayer then has the option to appeal further if they're not satisfied or happy. And so this is another process to learn, but important to know that that is a open public meeting. So if someone wants to sit in the back of the room and listen to all your grievances, they can do that. Okay. So what is a homestead declaration? Residents in Vermont are required to annually file a homestead declaration. If they live and own a property they live in as their primary residence in Vermont. The tax form for the declaration is called the HS-122, or Homestead Declaration. When a homestead is declared in Vermont, that person will pay homestead education taxes rather than non-residential education tax. These are different. So that once, it, if you create that homestead value that we talked about, once a person declares, then that homestead value is gonna be used to attach to that homestead education rate. That's the purpose of it. So okay. even if you know that somebody does not live in that property, they're not a state or they're li they don't, there's no way they live there, still put a value up for homestead. It's good to have in place because once they file, if they sell it or file, that value has always been there. And there's less work later. We, so we listers, have, yes. We have people that are on the voter registration list yep. and we know live in town full time, but they don't file an HS 122 or an HI 144. And that's, we're going to have another session um, this afternoon, this right? afternoon, right? Elizabeth, yours is at 11? I think your, your homestead one's at 1 o'clock, but one. I'm not positive. Your homestead and current use best responses to this. The state is 11 15. 11, 15. Oh, 11 15. And somebody from the tax department will actually be there. Yeah. And that's perfect. Remember that question. <laughs> <laughs> Listers review the list of these filed homesteads and give feedback to the state. And she's the one you give feedback to. Um, Vermont? Yeah. That they may know about whether or not the person lives there. The Listers then need to assign values for portions of the property or the whole that they filed by the taxpayer on the HS-122 as business or rental use as these properties pay non-residential education tax. So a property owner could own a portion of or rent a portion or get money for a portion of their home that you would have to allocate. And I think what's important to know is for each of these processes that we talk about, current use we talked about, homestead we're talking about. We have documents for each of these pieces to walk you through. So don't panic. If you're not sure what to do, you call us, we give you the document, we help you out, and we help you how to walk through those processes. So you don't feel like you're left out in the, that's our job as district advisors to help you find that, those resources. <coughs> so what is a house site? In addition to homestead lister, listers assign a house site value, which is a portion of or the same as the homestead value, and is used to compare to the taxpayer income, compared to the taxpayer's yeah. income, to see if they are eligible for a homestead payment to offset their taxes, or based on a percentage of income they pay in taxes. Listers do not do this calculation, but they need to understand what the house site is so they can assign a value on the grand list correctly. Yep. So again, it's used for income sensitivity like we talked about. Yeah. So how, do, how will listers grow? Don't get overwhelmed. Expect three years to know the job. At least. At least. That's when you start to really pick it up. How I think you, you learn things every year. I still learn things every year. Yes. I think that's what makes the job good is that it's there's new things all the time and you that's learn. Why I'm here. That's why I'm here. That's why yeah. It's good for your brain. It's always good for your brain to learn new things. How to defend values. How to study the map market and portions of the market. How to find statutes. 
how to assess difficult properties, solar qualified housing, call your district advisor, right? How to data collect from beginning to end. How to understand fair market value and how it relates to assessment. How to understand my land schedule and reappraisal multipliers or neighborhood multipliers. How to understand the equalization study and what it actually means. Take classes in appraisal and assessment. We have grants that you can fill out and take. As long as it's got to do with assessment, we pay it. It's free education. Use the PVR website, the Lister Handbook, and the other resources. 